Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for being here today. What a sweet time of worship that was, wasn't it? I just love that. Yeah, you can, you can give God a hand, give our worship team a hand. Man, that was incredible. I'm so glad you are all here to worship God with us this morning. As they mentioned, we had to move all of our normal instruments off the stage, so an acoustic set is always a lot of fun. I really enjoy that. Um, also want to give a shout out. Where are Canica counselors at today? <laughs> There they are. Hey guys, so glad you're here. Thanks for joining us and thanks for investing in our young people this week. We've got a lot of stuff happening this week and Canacook is uh, one of those things that reaches a lot of young people, a lot of kids. So thank you for being here and doing that. We've got a bunch of them staying at our house and I know many of you are hosting counselors as well. So thank you so much for doing that. Yeah, who else is hosting people here? Anybody? We got, we got all over the auditorium. That's great. Very good. They appreciate it. Um... All right, well, it is so good to have you here, and uh, we are thankful for things like the carpeted stage, and I don't know if you remember, but before the pandemic, this room looked a little bit different. Uh, we had tiny little screens up there. We had a very different sound system. We're all thankful for the new sound system. If you remember what that sounded like before we got it replaced, wow, it was, you don't, we don't need to go back there. But uh, we're very thankful for all of the stuff that's happened over the last couple of years here. We've got a new uh, courtyard out there, new north patio, and a lot of work being done on the corner park, and, and there's more to come. There's the, the uh, pergola shade structures are going to go up in the north patio, and uh, we've got a pavilion we're going to put out on the park. As soon as the cost of wood isn't the same as Italian marble, we will go ahead and put those things in. But God has been really good to us, and we're very thankful for it. And on top of all the other great things that he's done through you, and we're going to talk about some of those later in ministering to the community, um, he's also doing some great things here and just given us a wonderful place to be able to worship God together. And we're super thankful for that. Thankful for our facilities team that keeps it all looking good and ready to go. And, and a lot of this is, thank, is thanks also to your giving. And last year, we did a special campaign to make sure that we could afford some of these improvements. And the carpet, for instance, wasn't just a nicer thing to look at, but it was actually a safety hazard. I saw a picture this week just by accident of what the lobby used to look like with the old green stained carpet, and it was kind of from one end, and you could see all of the ripples down the way. It was a tripping hazard. Uh, it was actually our insurance told us this, this is a problem if you keep this carpet here. So all of these improvements make ministry more effective, and uh, your giving is a big part of that. Your serving here is a big part of that. Uh, if you are new to First Free and aren't sure how to give, we aren't passing plates right now like we used to, so you can go to efree.org slash give, and you can give a, a one-time gift. You can set up a recurring gift there, whatever you want to do. We also have giving boxes out in the lobby. There are a couple out there in case you want to give something physically and drop it in the box. Feel free to do that as well. You guys can come up here if you want. Well, I'll give you two more ways that you can give. One is if you want, if you shop at Schnucks, well, this is really distracting. I wish I wouldn't have called you up so early, <laughs> but if you, st we'll explain this in just a minute. This has a point. If you shop at Schnucks, that's hard to say, uh, a portion of what you buy will actually go to First Free if you sign up. And then also if you shop at Amazon, which I doubt many of you do, but if you happen to buy anything on Amazon, you can sign up and a portion of your purchases will actually go to the church. So those are some great ways. You can get more information about all of that at efree.org slash give. And there's some contact information there too if you need help getting all of that set up. Another way that you can help out in the church is by serving, which you may have guessed is why these two ladies are up here. Kelly Thomas, Kelsey Dieters, working our Kid Connection. I am a little surprised that you did not come up with that play music, but I appreciate it since I was still talking at the time. So <laughs> I could have sang on my way up. Yeah. So anyway, you guys are here because Kid Connection has some awesome stuff going on, and you're going to tell us all about it. What are you most excited about in Kid Connection and Fusion right now? So we are growing, and it's exciting. We have new families. In fact, this morning, we had a lot of new families come in the door, and we are super excited to share the gospel with those families. So that is exciting. I was late coming in here because of all of our new families this morning, which that is a perfect reason to be late. So yep. it was yep. super exciting. Um, we have a ton of energy downstairs. We are working on every ministry area in preschool. We are working on, uh, or I'm sorry, in nursery, actually. We're working on story time and worship and play for those little babies. In preschool, we're getting the kids into smaller groups so they have time to feel known and loved and heard by their leaders. And Casey Friends, which is our special needs ministry, we're getting one-on-one -on -one buddies for every single one of those kids. Uh, in early elementary, which is K through three, we're having fun and interactive and applicable lessons for them. And we're getting a live worship going, which is super exciting. 
Um, and then in Fusion, which is my area, fourth and fifth grade, um, we are just having great um, space. We've put them in their own area. They have great space for fellowship and to connect with one another and to learn more about God and to dig deep into the Bible. And we might even add a waffle bar for them. So that's kind of exciting. Wow. Um, and then every month we have a super fun theme. So this month is press play. Can you see my backpack? <laughs> um, it's an 80s theme. Um, and we're learning about confidence, which is actually very good because otherwise we would not be doing this right now. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole thing, just to be clear, is an 80s theme. Yes. With <laughs> to be clear. I figured I'd just connect those dots for people. And there is even a photo booth downstairs, right? That they could go enjoy? There is. Come take pictures with the kids downstairs. Yes. There's just a quick waiver you sign that signs you up to serve in one of the ministries yeah, and then you can... That's right. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. You can enjoy the photo booth free of charge, no strings attached, except for a slight service commitment. Yes. Doesn't that sound good? Yep, sounds great. Yeah. A lot of people are wondering, when are we going to be offering a 9 a.m. kids ministry again? We stopped that during the pandemic. Are we going back to it? Yes. So even though we had a lot of questions and we weren't sure how we were going to do it, we said, nope, we're going to put our faith in God. And we are doing both services downstairs come August 15th. So super excited about that. Um, so it'll be 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Um, and uh, August 15th is also Promotion Sunday, which is um, our theme was going to be up, if you've ever seen the movie. And that is when all of our kids move up a grade. So all of the kids, um, it's a super, super exciting time for them. And um, like the kindergartners will go into the early elementary room, and then all of our third graders will move up into Fusion, which is a huge thing. So, um, yeah, we're super excited about that. And just to add, Fusion will only be at 9 a.m., and at 11 a.m., they get to come worship with their parents. That's awesome. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's a hard decision to add that extra hour, and uh, what you tell us, would you tell us about some of the challenges involved in doing that? Yes, and so like I said, we were really unsure and we're still unsure on what it's going to look like because our volunteer base is limited. Um, it is so limited that we still require reservations for our kids and with this, even with these new families coming, there are times where we have to turn families away. We can't, there are times when we have to tell our kids no, we can't because it's, it may be unsafe if we have too many kids down there and not enough leaders or not enough just volunteer base. Um, and so that has actually been one of our biggest, biggest challenges. Um, and, you know, COVID, obviously. COVID's the answer to everything, right? So, so with COVID and just um, trying to restructure, it has, has just been challenging, but we've really just overcome it, and we're putting our faith in God to make this happen. So we're super excited about that. So you're saying we need more volunteers. Am I hearing that correctly? We need more correctly? volunteers. Okay, that, Adam, that's a first. Adam, you didn't tell me that there's going to be so many more people at the 11 a.m. service, so that's exciting. What type of volunteers do you need? Yes, so um, we have all types of volunteer opportunities, and a lot of people think, okay, kids ministry, I have to work with kids, and that is not the case. We actually have a ton of opportunities where um, you, you don't work directly with children. So we do have a connections team even downstairs. We have an awesome connections team up here as well. Um, and then we also do tech, which you don't need any experience for that. Um, and then we also have a, a coach leadership role where you're actually pouring into the volunteers um, and working directly with the volunteers instead of the kiddos. But we also obviously have kid, uh, kid focused leadership roles as well and volunteer roles. So that is small group leaders, um, gosh, any type of leading downstairs and hosting. yeah, the hosting, story yeah, oh, storytelling, Bible lessons, all kinds of things to do. So you don't have to love working with kids no. to help out in Kid Connection. In fact, we need some of those people we who don't necessarily <laughs> enjoy working with kids to get involved. So you hear that, everyone? We, how can people, if they want to get involved, what do they do? We would love for you to come talk to us, come down to the lobby, seek us out. Um, we would love to have a conversation with you. You can also go to efree.org slash kids, and there is an I'm interested button that you can click on. It takes you to a volunteer form that you can fill out, and it gives you all the opportunities that we have down there. And then we will get right back with you and talk to you. Um, and then also, we always love for people to come to observe. So if you want to come downstairs and observe what's happening, kind of figure out what your, what your desire and passion is, and we can get you in place. That's a yes. great idea. If you're not sure, go check it out. You can, you can watch it and just look at it. There's no obligation, no judgment if you don't sign up or anything like that, at least I assume. Yeah, totally. awesome. no judgment. Hey, thank you for being here and sharing. Would you Thanks. thank them for sharing with Thanks. us? I do have to say, I so admire your commitment to the theme with the boom box and everything. Way to go. Those kids are having such an awesome time down there. If you haven't had a chance to just sneak down there and, and look at the, the kids' ministry, uh, my goodness, if you're interested in volunteering, this would be a great chance to just kind of take a look at it and see what they do. And it is really, really awesome. Very exciting what's going on down there. And uh, we're, we're very thankful for our staff and, our, and many volunteers that pull it off.
Well, this morning is going to be a little bit of a different Sunday because I'm not going to do a normal preaching time like I usually would. We're, we're going to get back to that soon. You know, in the next couple of weeks, we've got uh, next week, we've got the president of the EFCA is going to be here to share with us. After that, we launch into the justice series where we're talking about justice from a biblical perspective and the God of justice and social justice and where all those overlap and contrast and all that stuff. We have some special guest speakers that are coming to join us for that. And uh, at the end of that, we're going to get back finally to the first Timothy study. So we're going to get back into a book study of the Bible very shortly, and we're really, really excited to get there. But today we're talking about vision and values. And last week we introduced you to a fresh updated vision statement for our church. And you'll remember a vision is what we see the church becoming in the future. That doesn't mean it's not somewhat already there, but we see this as the ideal wording of of what's, what's the church supposed to look like. And what would we like our church to look like in the future? It's the destination. Where are we headed? You don't want it to be too specific. You don't want it to be too generic. God may change our plans along the way, but we don't think he's going to change this. So let me show you that vision statement. Again, it says, First Free Church is a growing community, passionate about worshiping God, reaching the lost, growing spiritually, praying continually, deepening community, and developing leaders who continue those pursuits in every area of life. We talked about that vision statement in great detail last week. So if you missed it and you want more information, go back and watch last week's message on our website at efree.org slash messages, and you will get that whole thing with an explanation for it. We'll touch on it a little bit more today as we go through the rest of this time. But I just wanted you to have that in your mind. Again, it's going to get referenced throughout today's service. But what we're focusing on today is more of our distinctive values. If vision is the destination, values is what keeps you on track. Values are like plumb lines to help you know, are we aligned straight? Are we headed toward our vision correctly? Is this what we need to be focused on? So our values come out of our vision. And there are a couple kinds of values. One is theological values. Our theological values are well established for us in our statement of faith. And you can read that at efree.org slash beliefs. You can see our 10 points of doctrine in our statement of faith, and that includes dogma in there as well, for those of you that are familiar with the Undivided series and the buckets of belief, which we'll, we'll talk about that a little more later. But those 10 statements are the core of what we believe doctrinally, and they contain our theological values. And that includes things about God, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, about the Trinity, about salvation and what it means to be saved about eternity. It includes things about grace and compassion and prayer. All of those things are theological values to us that we hold very dearly. But there's a whole nother way of thinking about the church and their values, which is what's unique about this church. For instance, what is this church value that might be different than the church down the road? And yet both are good. Both can be okay. You know, God made the church with a lot of diversity and he made people with a lot of diversity in them. And no two of you are exactly alike. Uh, You can look around and verify that, but I'm pretty sure that no two of you are exactly alike. There There are little differences between us, even if we can't always see them or notice them. In fact, I don't even think any two of you are wearing the same shirt today. Uh, I don't think so. We're all very different people. And since churches are made up of people, churches are very different too. God loves this kind of diversity. And you know how I know God loves this kind of diversity? It's not an accident. It's actually intentional on his part. Not only did he build this into our genetic code and design us to be fruitful and multiply and look really different, but when he creates us anew in Christ Jesus and we become his children, part of the family of God, he gives us spiritual gifts, but not all the same. He gives us different spiritual gifts. And no, none of us have the same combination of abilities and experience and history and gifting, spiritual gifting. And so we're all uniquely created by God through everything we have in our life and what he's given us spiritually to be able to serve in the body of Christ and serve in the community in unique and different ways. God loves diversity. And what happens then is churches are diverse. They're made up of very different people and so they look different too. Our church is going to be able to reach people that other churches will not and they will be able to reach people that we will not. There's no such thing as a perfect church for everyone. This church is not gonna be the right fit for everybody out there. There are gonna be some people that 
that they, they love Jesus and they believe in the gospel and they believe the same stuff we do. And yet the church down the road is, is a better fit for them and how they need to grow spiritually and praise God for that. That's okay. We don't all need to be part of one centralized church. God designed this thing to spread out. And as it spread out, there were differences. Some of those differences are better than others. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But the point is, we are going to be a little bit different, a little bit unique compared to other churches. And what we want to do is lean into that. We want to ask, what are the areas where God has uniquely gifted us and given us passions as followers of Jesus and as a church that we can dig deep into? If we try to do everything a church can do, then we're going to do a lot of things poorly because there are a lot of things we can try to do. But if we will identify a few key areas of focus and really hone in on those and go deep in those areas, we can make a huge impact for the kingdom where God has gifted us. And this has to do with geography and resources and spiritual gifting and the types of people in the church and just the opportunities God has put in front of us and church leaders and church leadership and the passions that they have. So we've been working on these for a long time. And last week we shared a couple of them with you. The first one was Jesus is the difference. Jesus is the difference. And the reason that is kind of unique compared to some places is we are not going to be just Sunday Christians. We do not want to be, we show up on Sunday, we do the church thing, we check the box, and then we go about our week living our normal life. Jesus needs to be the difference in everything we do, every aspect of our life. He has got to be the difference at work, at school, wherever we are with family, with friends, going shopping. We're always thinking about what Jesus wants us to do, how he wants us to live, because he's made such a difference in our lives. The second distinctive value we shared is love is a verb. The Bible says that we shouldn't just say we love each other. We need to show our love by our actions. It's really easy to say, we love you. I love you. I love your enemies. It's really easy to say it. It's really hard to do it. We want to put love in action. And that's especially true when it comes to the other people in the body of Christ. The Bible talks about that. Jesus talks about that. How the way people will know that we are his disciples is by how we show love for, can you finish it? One another, each other. Now you might expect Jesus to say, the way other people will know you're my disciples is by how you love them, but that's not what he says. It's by how you love each other. It's by other people outside the body of Christ seeing how you treat each other and going, something's different about them and I want in. They're going to know you're his disciples by how you treat each other. And so love is a verb. We want to put it into action. So I'm going to share four more distinctive values with you today, and we're going to invite some people up to talk about those as we go. It'll, it'll be a very different kind of, of message and, and service, but I think we'll get a lot out of it, and I hope that you will enjoy it and learn some things as we go from everybody that's going to come up here. The next distinctive value I want to share with you is all about unity in the body of Christ. This is a big deal to us here, and I'm, I'm not going to go into great detail because we, we're going to invite somebody up to talk about it a little bit more. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says to the Corinthian church, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Now, it would be easy to think that he's writing this to warn them about becoming divided in the future, but that is not the case. He says, for some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. So Chloe's household ratted out the church in Corinth. And Paul heard about this and went, ah, uh -uh, you guys cannot have these kinds of divisions. You need to be living in harmony with each other. And Paul repeated this kind of idea of, hey, you need to live in harmony to the, the churches in Galatia and Philippi and Rome and Colossae and Ephesus. And Peter even writes it in one of his letters. This was a big problem in the early church. And let's be honest, has it really changed? Christians are so good at dividing with each other and often over issues that maybe in the grand scheme of things aren't all that important. Now, if you want to take an in-depth look at what we mean when we talk about unity in the body of Christ, there is a series on our website called the Undivided Series, and you can go to efree.org slash undivided, and you will find, I think it's a seven-part series there that explains in great depth what we would call the buckets of belief, things that we use to help us categorize our beliefs and focus on what matters most and not divide over secondary issues. It's really important to us. Because Paul, in this letter to Corinth, says, I want you to live in harmony. I want you to be united, not divided. I want you to be of one mind. But he also acknowledges in 1 Corinthians 8 through 10, you are going to have some things you disagree on. There's going to be some stuff that the people over here disagree with the people over there. And that's okay. You still have to get along. How do we do that? 
So the Undivided series is a great thing to go back and reference if you haven't watched already to learn kind of how we do that in the body of Christ. But I wanna give you the value so that you know what it is. It's heaven is big. Heaven is big. We're trying to keep all these kind of consistent in their terminology. So Jesus is the difference. I'm already forgetting the second one. Love is a verb. There we go. That's not good. I knew one of you would yell it out. And heaven is big. Heaven is big. And by that, we don't mean everybody's going to get there. Okay, we believe that only by salvation through faith in Jesus Christ and, and not of any works that you do can you get to heaven. But what we're talking about is many of us grew up in a tradition where we went to a certain church and we thought the people in the church down the road probably weren't saved because they believed a few different things than us. And in some cases, that's true. They believe a different gospel, and that is absolutely a real thing. But in many, many cases, we look at other believers, and we can get this friction, this animosity, because we have a difference about something that's actually, in the grand scheme of things, somewhat insignificant compared to the gospel of Jesus. And we might look at a brother or sister with contempt. That's what was happening in the early church. When the believers in Corinth were saying, well, I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of, of Jesus, and I'm of Paul, and they had separated in these different factions, and Paul says, knock it off. You're all followers of Jesus Christ. You're, you all have the same Holy Spirit. You read the same Bible. Why do we have these divisions among us? Now, that doesn't mean we can't talk about it. That doesn't mean we can't disagree. That doesn't mean we can't debate. But at the end of the day, we hug each other and say, you're a follower of Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we say that heaven is big, not because everybody's gonna get there, but because we wanna recognize the fact that there are brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world who are gonna be there with us in the end. And I would tell you that I think our church is a bit of a picture of what heaven is gonna look like because we have a lot of different views in this church. And it's one of, the, one of the hallmarks of the EFCA and of this church in particular is that we will not divide over secondary issues. So heaven is big. To talk about this more, I'm gonna invite one of our pastors, Kevin Crosley, to come up and join me on the stage. Would you give him a hand to make the walk less awkward? Thank you, sir. They didn't clap long enough to make it less awkward. I know, I even told them. But you know, with the tripping hazard gone, at least I didn't fall over on my face, so that's not That awkward. is nice, that is really nice. And that's thanks to you and your team, so thanks for pulling that off. Where does this idea of an undivided mindset come from? Yeah, I think you did a great job of saying, okay, Paul really hits this hard in all of his epistles. And I think about his teaching to the Corinthian church when they were dividing over meat offered to idols. And he said, you know, you really have to focus on the relationship in the body as opposed to taking a stand on these secondary issues. Um, you know, after the New Testament, then you go to the early church and even in the fourth century, there's a quote attributed to Augustine that says, on the essentials, unity, on non-essentials, liberty, and in everything, charity or love. And for me, that idea of allowing others to have different perspectives on the non-essential things is a way that we love each other. And it ties right back to that one, that love is a verb. It is, it is the way that love shows up in our congregation by being unified on the essentials, but then allowing each other to, to be wrong when they don't think like I think about the non-essentials. Yes. Um, and then I think about here at First Free and as part of the Evangelical Free Church uh, denomination, that this is something that has been at the core of who this church is from the very beginning. Um, if you dig into, and I do this sometimes, the, the proceedings of the theological meetings of the EFCA, um, you'll quickly run into a paper called Drawing Denominational Lines, which covers exactly this. Where should we separate and where should we be unified? And that paper was written by Mike Andrus, who was the founding pastor of First Free here in St. Louis County. And so it just shows that this has been a central idea for this local body of believers from the very beginning. And, and I think that's a neat way that you fit in because you brought us the Undivided series and the language of buckets of belief, which say, you know, there are some things that are dogma 
Those are the, the essentials of Christianity. If you don't believe those, then I don't know what religion you're practicing, but it's not Christianity, at least according to the Bible. Um, then there's doctrine, stuff that's unique to us, that we believe this, this is what we're willing to divide on. And then a whole lot of stuff that we put in what we call the convictions bucket or the preferences bucket. And do you know, we put this new carpet in and it's throughout this. And I wanna commend you because not one person has said, you know, I don't like the color of the carpet. You have let the people who pick the carpet be wrong or to disagree with them if you don't like. I personally love it. I think it's great. But I'll be honest with you. I think the secret to that is to let it get so bad <laughs> that anything's an improvement. That's anything, anything's it better than It worked with the sound system. It worked with the green waves. The carpet. So, yeah. <laughs> no, but that's true. That's true. We don't want to divide over those things. And I've, I've been in churches that got really upset over a wall that got painted a color and somebody didn't like it. And it's like, oh man, guys, if this is what we're focusing our time on. Then we're we're missing the boat here. The undivided stuff has been really, really important to me. I've been in churches that have had splits before. Um, I've, I've experienced a lot of the division that happens in churches and it, and it hurts and it's, it's, a real, um, it's a real challenge. I think the undivided principles, um, what, 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 no matter what terminology you use for them, help us to better understand how to get along in our lives. Have you seen those principles at work in your life? How have you experienced this? Yeah, I have. Hey, I grew up in a denomination where my favorite joke about my particular denomination was when St. Peter was giving a tour of heaven, he had everybody be quiet and crawl through a certain area of heaven. And somebody asked him, you know, Peter, what is that all about? And he said, well, that's where the denomination Kevin's from is kept in heaven, and they think they're the only ones that are here. And, and so it was very divisive in terms of we have this perspective and we're going to hold to it and everybody else is out. Um, but when it really hit me personally, you know, in college, I finally came to, the, to, to a whole life commitment to Christ. And a few years later, I was in graduate school, I was getting a degree in chemistry, and a speaker came to campus and said, if you don't believe that the age of the earth is this, and he had a particular perspective, then you are not a Christian. And that shook me because I was, I was studying science and I could see differences or perspectives and, and it, was, it was really a challenge to my new commitment to, to follow Christ with my whole life. Somebody, somebody shared with me soon after that a different perspective. And he said, when God's word and God's world appear to conflict with each other, then the fault is ours. We're either misinterpreting God's word or we're misinterpreting God's world and creation, um, but the fault is ours. And that humility, that willingness to say, we don't know all of the answers. Um, and we need to be, be um, practicing liberty and charity in those areas was really helpful for me. Yes, and humility and graciousness and just the fact that, you know, all of us think we're right naturally, but we, we don't all agree on those things. So somebody's got to be wrong. We're not talking about relativism here where everybody's right. Uh, when we get to heaven, we'll find out who's right and it'll probably be me. You know, let's just be honest. But... <laughs> No, there will be things in heaven where I'm going to get there. I'm absolutely convinced of this. And the Bible says that we will know fully even as we are fully known, that now we see dimly like through a mirror. And, and the, the scales are going to come off our eyes in heaven. And there are going to be a few things for every one of us, maybe a lot of things, where we're going to go, oh, that's what you meant by that? That's what you were doing? That's how that worked behind the scenes? wow, I had no idea. Jesus did this to the two guys on the road to Emmaus when he opened up the Old Testament scriptures and he showed them how all of the Old Testament pointed to him. And nobody had any concept of that back then. They had no idea this stuff could point to him in that way. I think he's gonna do that again with us and we are going to see stuff that, that we never saw before. So why would we get so worked up and so have so much animosity with other people over something that, you know what, God's gonna reveal an awful lot to us once we get to heaven. And you know what, we're in, when we're in his presence, it's really not gonna matter. Know, yeah. It really is. That's so true. What do you think the undivided mindset means for First Free? Yeah, I think the, the value of this value is that it, 
it really pushes us to create a place where, one, we are solid on the fundamentals. We are solid on the dogma and the doctrine of the Christian faith. And we, we guard that and we protect it. And we make sure that false teaching or wrong ideas about who God is or who Jesus is or how we can be restored in our relationship with him, that, that those don't get mixed into what we're doing. But at the same time, we recognize that a whole bunch of the issues fall in that conviction or preference bucket and that we're not going to divide over that. And it allows us to have things like, you know, Doug Pogue and I a, a few couple years ago taught a class on creation. And our statement of faith says, and we all agree, God created the heavens and the earth. God created everything that's been created. But the how he created it and how long it took, there are different people in Christianity that are all, that hold different perspectives. And we were able to teach those different perspectives um, and, and help the students understand where it's clear and where there are still questions. Yeah, I think that's really important. Thanks so much for sharing with us today. Yeah, I appreciate great it. Great to be here. So heaven is big means we're not going to divide over secondary issues here. We want heaven to be big in another way, too, because we want to bring a lot of people into it, into the kingdom. We want to see more people come to trust in Jesus. And, and we believe that is our responsibility, not just as a church, but as individual believers. You know, some people think that reaching people for Christ is about those people that have the gift of evangelism or it's for the pastors to do. But we believe it's actually something that everyone should be involved in. Jesus told his disciples to go teach people, to go make disciples and teach them to follow everything that he taught them to do which includes that instruction he just gave them to go make disciples. That means it's supposed to be this never-ending cycle where we're reaching people who are reaching people and it's continuing on and on and on. You've heard me say many times, the gospel came to you on its way to someone else. Don't let that chain end with you. And so the value, the next value that I wanna share with you is called outreach is for everyone. Outreach is for everyone. This is something we should all be involved with. Now, I was going to have John Richardson um, come up here and share about our outreach strategy with you, but he is not available today. So I'm going to do my best and give you kind of a four-part outreach strategy. This is something we've actually been, been trying to do for the last few years here, and we've got a new staff member that we, we are super excited about that's going to help us really kick this into high gear. But let me give you kind of four aspects of our outreach strategy here. Uh, first, I'll tell you, a lot of churches, not a lot of churches, some churches will kind of decide on a few things that are going to be their outreach focus, and that's what they're doing. And our vision for outreach is a little bit broader than that. So that's why this is a distinctive value. You'll kind of see what I mean as we go through this. The first thing that I want you to think about when it comes to outreach strategy is outreach events. There are four things we're going to talk about. Outreach events is the first one. And you could picture a big circle divided into quadrants, and this is one of those quadrants, one of the top quadrants, is outreach is for everyone. And all of these quadrants we're gonna talk about interact with each other in different ways, they lead to each other in different ways, there's all sorts of neat things that happen when you put things in quadrants and find the relationships between them. We're not gonna go through any of the nuances of that today, we could spend a couple hours on it. I'm just gonna give you the four quadrants and what they mean to us. But outreach events are those big things that we do here like festivals and trunk or treats and concerts and special guest speakers and food truck events out in the parking lot and all sorts of things that we do to bring in a lot of people um, into the area, into the church in many cases and have a fun time, impact our community in a positive way, but also build relationships with people, introduce them to the church. The hope is that at these events, maybe if it's an event here in the building, somebody's going to walk into the church that normally would not go to church. And they're going to go, wow, this place is not as scary as I thought. And they're going to meet some of you there. And interacting with you, they're going to walk away and go, wow, these people are not as weird as I thought. And they might just come back on Sunday morning. Or they might get a chance to talk with you there. And, and, and you get to know each other a little bit. And as you're being friendly and, and welcoming and you form a relationship and you get to know them and you get to introduce Jesus to them. So outreach events are not the be-all, end-all for outreach. Not at all. But they are an important first step. They are the big part of the funnel to try to reach a lot of people and get them more connected with Jesus, more connected with the church, as well as do a lot of good for our community and just have a great reputation and testimony in our community. That's the first stage. The next one is called outreach partners. 
There are a lot of things we could get into as a church and we could try to start some new program, launch some ministry, but there is already a parachurch ministry that's doing a great job of that. And we do not want to reinvent the wheel. And so instead, we partner with a lot of organizations. You can see the list at efree.org slash make a difference. That's efree.org slash make a difference. And you can see a whole list of ways you can get involved as well as our outreach partners. When you give to support the ministry of this church, some of your giving then goes to ministries that we have vetted that are doing amazing work in the St. Louis area and around the world. And so you're actually providing financial support, not just for us, but also for a number of other ministries that we have a relationship with. There's accountability there. We have vetted them. We know that we're like-minded. If they ever stop being like-minded, we're going to stop supporting them. And you are giving to support them as well. But you help them in other ways too. This was especially evident during the pandemic when some of our ministries had a lot of downtime and some of you were able to go and renovate their spaces and fix things up and do a lot of things you couldn't have done otherwise because they had so much downtime. We want to be a church that is serving people in our area in lots of different ways. We don't want to do something on our own if someone else is already doing a great job of it. We just want to partner with them. And so Outreach Partners is the next stage of that outreach strategy. That we have. And again, you can see all of our partners at efree.org slash make a difference. So outreach events and outreach partners, the third one I am really, really excited about, and that is outreach teams. Outreach teams are an incredibly effective way, in my opinion, to reach a community for Jesus. Instead of isolating a few ministries that we're going to be all about and say, that's all we're going to do, what we're going to do when it comes to outreach strategy is say this, Where is God moving in the hearts of our people and how can we get behind them to reach people with that passion, that gifting? And outreach teams is a great way to do it. We set up a structure and a platform as opposed to a program that allows for people who have a passion to make a difference in a certain way to to come and get some training and to form a team together, a leadership team, and get volunteers involved and to try some kind of ministry that maybe ordinarily would not see the light of day in a church But because of this outreach team concept, this model, it allows us to try things, see what works, and get behind where God is moving. I I saw this to great effect in my last church. When we put this into place, we were really struggling with our outreach vision for the church and where to go. And, And once we finally sort of stumbled across this outreach team's kind of platform and put it all in place and put it together, we had some interesting things come out of the woodwork. Of course, we had the the Salvation Army teams and we had multiple nursing home teams. We had teams of people that would do children's ministry in different communities. We had teams that were specifically reaching underprivileged areas and were focusing on those areas, which was great. We had a handyman team with over 60 people that was putting in uh, wheelchair ramps and fixing doors and doing all kinds of work for people that really needed help, all in the name of Jesus. Phenomenal ministries. But a couple of people came to me and said, we would like to start an outreach team for ballet. And that was a very unusual thing to think about. Like in our church, we're going to have a ballet ministry in our church. What? Are you sure? Is that going to work? Is this going to, is anybody going to come? Are people going to be okay with this? And just a couple years later, we had 200 people in our ballet ministry at the church twice a week, learning how to do ballet in Jesus name. Now, most of those people were not part of our church and many of them were not followers of Jesus at all. But they were all working with teachers who were dedicated Christians, were sharing the gospel with them, discipling them in many cases, and reaching their family members and their grandparents and their uncles and aunts. It was such a cool ministry. Now, am I saying that we are going to have a ballet ministry at First Free Church? No, that's not what I'm saying. It depends on which of you are into ballet. But chances are there are some gifts that we have in our church some abilities we have in our church, some things that you can do that you've never thought about before could be leveraged to reach people in Jesus' name, to make a difference in other people's lives, to serve them, to love them, to care for them, but to also bring them the most important message they could ever hear in their life. And what we wanna do as a church is be ready to facilitate and equip that and do it well. That also means it's okay to try something and have it not work. Uh, That means that there are are certain things that you might start for a while and then, well, that there's no more people that wanna lead this anymore and so, God has spoken. We're just going to let it fizzle out for a while. And then maybe we bring it back when God brings the people back in. And I've seen all of that happen, the life cycle of these things. But instead of putting all of our eggs in one kind of outreach basket, outreach teams lets us ask the question, where is God moving in the hearts of our people? And how can we get behind that? As you know, we've just hired an outreach coordinator that we think is going to really help us put this into place. 
There's one more aspect of our outreach strategy that I'll share with you, and that is sort of the last quadrant that we get to, and that is called missional living. So we had outreach events, we have outreach partners, outreach teams, and missional living. Ideally, this is where every Christian lives up. It is so, it ends up, excuse me, it is so common for us to do an outreach like once a month and be like, okay, I checked my box, I did my thing, that's all good. Or to go on a missions trip and we have that missions trip high, you know what I'm talking about? And we're so excited about that, but then we come up and come back and two weeks later, it sort of fizzles out. We want to be living missionally, on mission for God all the time. That means when we are out at the store and we get into a conversation with someone that seems like maybe this is an opportunity. They're asking some pretty interesting questions here. We don't shy away from that. We don't duck out of it. We actually take that opportunity to share with them as appropriate what we believe or or engage with them in some way. That means that we orient our our lives in such a way that we're interacting with neighbors and friends and coworkers and other people, uh, not just so that we can have a fun time, but so that we can maybe help them out spiritually and answer some questions and point them to God at some point. We're living on mission for Christ, not just the occasional outreach, but our whole lives are viewed as outreach, no matter what we do for a career, what we do with our time, all of that. Some people in our church may get to the point where they say, I am so committed to this and so serious about reaching people for Christ with my life that I'm actually gonna get up and move to go be in a community that needs Jesus. And I'm gonna plant myself there to help those people know more about Jesus. You know, when we do like an outreach team, for instance, and we go into a community and we do, we could do block parties and I've done all these things in the past. We could do all sorts of things to help people and we come in there once a month or, or even once a week. It is a completely different level when there's someone who's actually living there who is working with you and you, under, and you get to do a Bible study in their home and you get to know them really well, there is a trust and a transparency that builds there that is just so incredible. It goes above and beyond anything an outreach team could do. And I could see us having people, maybe a handful of people who would say, I'm gonna go live in that apartment complex down the road and I'm gonna do Bible studies there and we're gonna form an outreach team around this that's gonna come help and support this. But we're gonna reach that community for Jesus. Wouldn't that be such an awesome thing to see? We have three, four apartment complexes right within like a one mile radius around here. And I don't know anyone that goes to our church from those communities. And there are other pockets like that. Uh, some, some pockets of, of, of people from a specific origin that we might be able to go reach and be a, a local missionary to those people. And we're just gonna plant our family there or myself as an individual there. We're gonna reach them. We're gonna build an outreach team around that. This is what it takes to reach a community for Jesus. This is all part of the outreach strategy. Events, partners, teams, and missional living, and we're really excited about it. I could go on and on and on, but I'm not going to because in a few weeks, we're gonna dedicate a whole service to talking more about how you can get involved and make a difference through outreach, and John will be back for that, so I will let him talk about that more. There are two more distinctive values that I'll share with you. And the second to the last one revolves around our groups. And I know I talk a lot about groups because it is so important. It is so valuable to us. In fact, just this week, I had two different gatherings with our small group and it was awesome. And it's so refreshing and encouraging. It does something for us that we don't get in this room. The reality is that the people over here don't all know the people over there and you can't because there's too many people in the room and not even to mention the people in the balcony and just getting to know everybody in here, that's not gonna happen. But so much of what the Bible says we are supposed to be as the body of Christ needs to happen in community where we know each other. We know each other's names and we know each other's kids and we know when we're missing and we know what's going on in each other's lives. And just because of scale, that can't happen in this big room. And that's okay. In the early church, you look back at the book of Acts, the early church, they met in Jerusalem at the temple to worship God together, but they also met in homes. And where a lot of the stuff happens that the Bible talks about for the body of Christ is in homes, in small groups, in Sunday morning groups. It's in a smaller gathering. When we grow big, we have to get small. Here are some of the things the Bible says that we are supposed to do for each other in the body of Christ. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. I'm gonna take a wild guess that those of you sitting over here are not gonna feel comfortable going to a random person over here and confessing your sins to them. But with a group of people, five, 10, 15 people that you've gotten to know over the last year or two, yeah, you're gonna get more real with them. You're gonna confess your sins with them. They're gonna be able to pray for you and hold you more accountable. That's why it's so important. Hebrews 3.13 says, you must warn each other every day. Well, it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against 
God. You can't be responsible to warn them every single day. But if you're in a small group, you guys are in fellowship with each other, you're talking all the time, you're texting all the time, you see each other a lot, you can warn each other. Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. 1 Peter 4, 8, 9 says, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, so encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. Galatians 6, 2 says to share each other's burdens. Well, you gotta know about the burdens to be able to share them with each other. And that happens in a smaller group. 1 Corinthians 11 says, so my dear brothers and sisters, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. If you are really hungry, eat at home so you won't bring judgment upon yourselves when you meet together. The idea here is that we are sharing meals together. We're living life together. We're doing things together that allow us to have this kind of depth of relationship that can only happen in a smaller community. I'm gonna invite one of our elders now, Ben Thomas, to come join me on the stage and talk about this value a little bit more. We call it community is core. Community is core. Ben? Thank you, Adam. Thanks for being here, man. I appreciate yeah, it. appreciate it. What are some of the ways that being in Christian community have impacted your life? First, I want to say I am so excited for Kelly and I to be able to join the uh, ballet outreach group, make that a part of our community. But until that happens, there's been a lot of ways that the Christian community has uh, really been important to my family and encouraged us. And um, just one story, I've mentioned it before on stage, so I'll make this quick. But when Kelly was pregnant with our youngest, Graham, she was about four months, a little over four months pregnant, and she thought she was losing him. And so she was rushed to the hospital. And I was out of town, and so as I was driving back from Memphis to St. Louis, it was 12.30, one in the morning, I started to get texts from our small group here at the church saying, hey, we're praying for you. Hey, anything we can do for you? How are you guys doing? And then I got texts later, this is past one in the morning that said, hey, our wives are driving down there. They're gonna go sit with Kelly. We know you're out of town. We'll go be with her and comfort her. And it was just so neat to see how that community came around us, lifted us up and just blessed us during that time. So that's only one story, but we have so many others where Kelly and I have felt challenged, encouraged, and really grown in our faith because of the Christian community around us. Yeah, it's so important. And you're a part of two communities, I know, two groups. You're in a Sunday morning group called TLC, and you are also in a small group as well. What are the differences between those groups? Yeah, it's a really good question because I think sometimes we try, we have different needs and we try to pull different needs based on the groups. And, and we really under, you need to understand that both groups serve a really vital purpose in our lives. Um, the the mid-sized Sundays group has really been helpful for us to connect to people, to pray with people, and really at a high level, just to check in with people and see how everybody's doing. And then our small group has been helpful because that's where we've been able to grow deeper with people and develop those deeper relationships. Our Sunday morning group is not super effective for growing a real deep relationship. And our small group is not super effective for helping us connect with more people and serving together in the church. But both of them have really, I think, provided a vital need for us and a vital need for our walk with God. So the value is community is core. It's the hub for everything we do. Why do you think we can't get that from a big gathering like this? Why do we need to do the small groups or Sunday morning groups? Yeah, yeah. So I know it's sort of cliche to some of you because we've heard it before, but I really think it is true. As a church grows bigger, it needs to grow smaller. And in uh, Proverbs 27, 17, it says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. You just can't get that in a large gathering like this as well. Um, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to be connected to each other. And we have to do that through those smaller gatherings. So Kelly and I have uh, traveled around the country quite a bit. And as we joined different churches, we really prayed that God would help us get plugged in. 
And one of those ways was joining a small group right away and joining a mid-sized group or a Sunday morning group right away. And we both have felt God's blessing through that. In fact, we've had a lot of friends that said, I can't believe how many people you know already in such a short amount of time. And it's, it's because God has blessed us through that. And we've had that ability of not only being part of the big group. And the, and the large gathering is, is very important too because the large gathering connects us to the values of the church. It gives us solid biblical teaching and it helps us grow spiritually. So the, the large gathering is important too, but we also need to be part of those smaller gatherings as well. So I kind of think to put a, a finer point on it, when we say community is core here at First Free, we're really talking about how from the large group to the small group to the in-between size group, they're all vital to our walk with God and they're, we play, we place an emphasis on all of them so that they can help us grow in our walk. So I heard this, this uh, analogy the other day and I really liked it. It said, uh, if I'm about to get married and I go up to a, a buddy and say, hey, what do you think of, of my new wife, of my, of my bride? And that person says, eh, not a big fan. I'd be kind of like, well, you know, hey, maybe I'd be polite to that person, but I'm not going to really have a long you know, lasting relationship with that person. Well, the church is Christ's bride. And if we want to be in Christ, if we want to be a part of Christ, we need to love his bride. We need to be connected to his bride. So I just loved how that was put. Um, finally, I'll just wrap it up here. Community is core because it's, it's um, commanded in the Bible. As uh, you put up those verses on the, uh, the screen, you can see the different verses. And one of them was Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And uh, we put on Hebrews 10, 24 on the screen about motivating us to love and good works. And then it goes on to verse 25 to say, and let us not give up meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I don't think we can really be in community if we're not loving each other and meeting with each other and doing all that. And I think that's really um, why this is such a strong value, community is core in our church. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, community is core is the distinctive value because we want our groups and our communities to be the hub for everything we do, right? We want care to happen there and discipleship and shepherding and, and all those things. Like that's the first line of, of defense when something goes wrong. What you experience, you know, when you think you've got a tragedy or you do have a tragedy, um, we want that to be the place where that starts because those are the people that know you well. And then this all ties back to the vision statement as well, where we talk about deepening community and those different levels we talked about last week of, of the public gathering and the social gathering and private and transparent and all those different things. We want deepening levels of community. And so we've got to get smaller and have those smaller groups to be able to do that. Thanks for sharing, yeah, Ben. It's been great. Thank you. So I've got one more value to share with you quickly here, and this is a distinctive value. It's something that not every church is going to necessarily have this focus, but we actually see this as being very important in the Word of God and specifically important for churches and church leaders. This is something that the Bible tells us we need to be doing as a church and as church leaders. This comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, or at least that's part of it. It says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Now, an old version of this, or an old translation of this verse, gave people the impression that it was the church leaders that were supposed to do the work of the ministry, but that was an inaccurate translation. Really, what the text says, the original text says, that the church leaders are to equip the believers to do the work of the ministry. That means that God has given as a responsibility pastors and church leaders, the ones mentioned here and then the ones that get added on to that to help all of these do their job, gave the church those roles so they could equip everyone to do ministry. We're all supposed to be in this together. We're all supposed to be doing ministry together. And so we as a church need to be equipping and raising up and training people who can serve in ministry. But not just that. Second Timothy chapter 2 says, you have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now, teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. 
So this is Paul, a leader of, of all churches, basically at this point, who is telling Timothy, a leader of the church in Ephesus, and the church is, all the churches that form one church in Ephesus, he is telling them, him, I want you to be looking for and raising up and training godly people who can then influence and train other godly people. Essentially, what he's saying is, I want you to make leaders. I want you to make leaders for Jesus, leaders who are going to influence other people. And, and that doesn't always mean teachers like in 2 Timothy, because equipping for ministry in Ephesians 4 can be all sorts of different ministry types. But we believe that God has specifically tasked the church with raising up and developing people who will influence other people for Jesus, who will be leaders for Jesus. Paul tells Titus in uh, the church in Crete, he says, I left you on the island of Crete so you could complete our work there and appoint elders in each town as I instructed you. And he goes on to give all these specifications for what an elder is supposed to be, what you're supposed to look for. And the idea is the church is to be seeking out and equipping and raising up and training people who will influence other people and pass these things on. The church needs to be developing leaders. And unfortunately, in many cases, we have relegated this to the world. And we have said, well, it's not our, our job is just to give more Bible knowledge. But no, the church needs to be equipping people. The church needs to be raising them up, training people who can train others. We believe it is absolutely a responsibility of the church, and we believe a special focus here on developing leaders who will influence the world for Jesus. That's why it's a part of our vision statement, and that's why it's a value. The value is leadership is learned. Leadership is learned. There are certainly some people who have sort of a natural bent towards what we would consider to be leadership. But the reality is all of us have influence on people and all of us can get better at this, at bringing that influence for Jesus into our workplace, into our school, with our friends, in everything we do. And so we are gonna place a special emphasis on developing leaders for Jesus here. Leaders who will go out and impact in other churches, leaders who will go out and impact the world for Jesus, and leaders who will have an impact right here. To tell you more about this, I'm gonna invite one of our Leadership Pathway members to come up and join me. This is Beth Tabor. Would you give her a hand, please? Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Great to have you up here sharing with us as our last interview. Yeah. Hold on, guys. We're going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you first, how have you seen God develop you as a leader? Um, well, I think the first thing is really just how he's developed me as a person. We lead out of who we are, our story, things that are particular to us. So I think, you know, heartache, um, my family, my history, disappointments, hopes, and my gifting. So I think that is for all of us, actually, how he's developing us. More specifically to me, I think, um, think of two ways that I have seen God maybe particularly um, intervene maybe in my leadership journey. And one was actually as a 21, 22-year-old, and it was really one of my first jobs out of college, and I was managing a small department, and kind of the suits flew in and said, hey, we'd like to promote you to manage these more departments, and we're doing it because we really like your leadership style. And genuinely, I looked at them and was like, what leadership style? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have one. And uh, I actually don't remember their response to that. But early in my career, really, it was very affirming to think, well, I think I care for the people I'm leading. Maybe that's what they want. Um, but I think initially God was like, hey, I've made you lead out of who you are. And that was an early message. Um, and then I think a second message was a refining message. And um, that came from a time when I was a co-director with um, a girl I worked with. And if you've ever been in a shared role where your success is tied to someone, there can be some challenges and certainly a lot of mirroring. And so I had a friend um, who was very dear to me who said some really hard things to me about who I was and how she experienced me. And I really had a choice to either receive that as true or not. And I feel like through that relationship, God really um, humbled me, challenged me, softened me. And so, um, yeah, I think believing other voices is a massive part of being a good leader. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, leadership is something, you know, it's all about influence, it's all about influencing other people. And sometimes we get this idea that there are only certain people can be, you know, special leaders and that kind of a thing. And certainly leadership looks different for different people. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are a lot of myths about leadership out there. What are some of the myths you can think of when you think about leadership? Um, 
I think that we often think that leadership is a particular personality and it's got to look a certain way. So if you're outgoing or you're loud or you're the first one to have a question or you're just really strongly opinionated, you should lead. And I think that that is really a wrong because particularly in the body of Christ, we are all equipped in certain ways. And I think he, in his foreknowledge, knows who our life will cross paths with. And so I think there really is a sense that because it is influence, all of us can lead. And um, I actually think of, um, there was a woman who was my sixth grade Sunday school teacher. Her name was Bev. And she was not what you would think as a typical leader. And um, she was quiet. Um, to be with sixth graders, she was very reserved. Um, but I think about her, and if we expand the idea of leadership not to being, you know, the loudest, most obvious person, but actually one of influence, she had great influence on my life and many people because of her, really the beautiful parts of her that were patient, gentle, and so she led us in that. So I think being concerned that we didn't get the right personality so we don't get to lead is a myth. Um, I think another is that there are leaders and there are followers, and you're one or the other. And I really think that that, again, is not true. I think that all of us need to be following, and uh, all of us need to be leading. And if we find that we haven't done one or the other in a while, we probably need to flex a muscle and step into that. Um, because we um, need each other, we need to be sharpened, and so I think there's lots of different voices that we need in that. So. Those are two that come to mind for me. That is so, so good. Why do you think it's important that the church develop leaders? Why not just leave that up to other institutions? Yeah. Well, I think as we all see, um, leaders sometimes fail. They don't do a great job. And a lot of that has to do with the way we pick leaders. And I think the world picks leaders um, based on who they are outwardly. Even the Bible says that, you know, you think of when Samuel came to pick the replacement for Saul, you know, immediately Samuel said, hey, I want, look at this oldest brother. He's good looking. He's tall. He's the obvious one. And um, God was reminding Samuel, you're judging based on your humanity, and I choose based on the heart. And then he ended up with David, the youngest and most inexperienced. Um, and so I really think that the church ought to be involved because we need those values. We need that reverse, which is the kingdom, to come in and be influencing the world where we are looking at people, not because they make the biggest splash or because they command the most um, audience even, but that we are as a church body looking at what's their gifting? How are they being called? Encouraging each other, challenging each other. And I think the church has a particular ability to do that because we have the spirit to help us discern. And um, we want to choose differently and not be caught in that, which is very easy to be caught in, of picking based on the outside. We want to pick based on the inside. So I think that's why the church is critical. I would also say we need a safe place. You know, I think that we fail to offer grace in a lot of places. Think of your workplace potentially. Um, you know, if you fail, there's maybe not a lot of grace. Um, but I also think that we also need a lot of truth. And I think those grace and truth are both lacking when it comes to a leader being able to say, hey, try again, or even giving good criticism of you could be better at this because we do need to learn and we need to be shaped. So I think the church, if we are building up and maturing as we are called to do, those voices are the best voices to be speaking into our leadership. That's right. That's right. I mean, we don't want to leave it up to the world for sure. The world's producing some pretty awful leaders. Yes. We want leaders who have Christian values and Christian principles who can take those into the workplace and into politics and into every aspect of life. So this, this needs to be a focus for the church. Certainly, we want it to be a focus here. Hey, thanks so much yeah. for sharing with us yeah. today. Thank I really you. appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you. So these are our distinctive values. Jesus is the difference in our lives. Love is a verb, something we do. Heaven is big. We are a big, diverse gathering that loves God, loves Christ, and we come together in doing so. 
Outreach is for everyone, and we are a very mature and knowledgeable group that doesn't do quite a lot of sharing, and we need to get back out there. Community is core. It will change your life. And leadership is learned. We can all get better. Um, finally, I'd like to give you one last admonition from Scripture as we consider these things from Colossians 3. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. So with that in mind, let's look again at our new vision statement. First Free Church is a growing community, passionate about worshiping God, reaching the lost, growing spiritually, praying continually, deepening community, and developing leaders who continue these pursuits in every area of life. So these are the things we value, and this is where uh, our church is going. These times are certainly very dynamic and challenging, but if we hold on to each other, um, love well, hang on to Jesus in the process, and have soft and gracious hearts with one another. I think we will, can experience God's blessings in ways that we may never have before. So let's go ahead and pray, if you'd bow your heads with me. God, thank you for this gathering of your flock at First Free. Thank you for caring for us, for loving us, and for your shepherding of this church. Lord, you have blessed us so richly with wonderful people, trained pastors, talented musicians, faithful volunteers, youngsters to keep us excited, and seniors to keep us wise. Lord, may you find us clothed in tender-hearted mercy, in your kindness, your humility, with a gentle spirit and with patience for each other. Lord, help us to make allowances for each other's faults, that we may forgive anyone who offends us. Lord, we remember that you forgave us and we are so grateful. Um, and ask that you'd help us to extend that same forgiveness to others. Above all, Lord, please help us to clothe ourselves with love, your love, Lord, which binds us together in perfect harmony. We seek your face now, Lord. Lead us in the way we should go, and let us give thanks to you, encouragement to each other, and may our walk bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name, amen.